Behind the Shades. My name is Jill. I am, I mean, I do a lot of things. I'm a fellow podcaster, but I'm also an author and a motivational speaker. So my, 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 um, main topic of content is usually personal development and time management. Uh, I speak mostly to moms who are interested in sort of finding themselves again. Once you become a mom, you kind of like everything goes on the the kid, right? And, and as much as that's fulfilling, there comes a point where you lose your own self. And so I was there and I help other women who find themselves in that position try to really um, reconnect with themselves. And I found some really cool um, and effective ways to do that um, that don't take a lot of time, energy, or money. So I spend a lot of time talking about that on my podcast. It's called Grow Like a Mother. And Grow Like a Mother is my handle on social media. I'm on Instagram and Facebook over there if you care to join. I did try TikTok, but honestly, like, I know I I am a millennial, but not really. You know, I just can't hack the TikTok thing. So I tried, but it's too much. I've been trying to get into TikTok because that's where all the young cats are, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, totally. Age, and you don't want to like show your your age, even though we're both quite young still. Yes, we are. <laughs> But tell us, or at least tell me and my audience, how did you get started in doing the work that you're doing? So I kind of had what a lot of people were, will refer to as like a dark night of the soul, right? So after I had my second baby, I decided that I didn't want to go back to my corporate job. And I took um, an opportunity to open up a retail consignment store in the town I was living in rather than going back to the hospitality world, which has odd hours. And it was a long commute. I thought, you know what, I'll just stay close to the family and I'm going to open up this consignment store. It felt really great. And then the recession hit and, or not the recession. Well, it was, I guess, but the pandemic. So it was 2020 and I was supposed to have kids going into daycare and the daycares closed And I was on the hook for this retail space in a storefront that couldn't open because the governments didn't really know what the pandemic was all about. And could we open? Could we not? You remember watching the TV every day at 11 for the prime minister to make his announcement, like what's open and what's not, right? Um, And I was having really bad postpartum anxiety and depression through all of it as well without really knowing it at the time. Also, um, that was just a few months before my my eldest child was diagnosed with autism. It's a lot going on. And so it all kind of came to a head one day um, when I thought the kids were going to be able to go back to daycare and I thought I'd be able to open the store and like the dream would would continue and I could get started. Um, and that wasn't to be. There was more shutdowns and delays and all of that. And I sort of realized that I needed to take control of my mindset because the external circumstances that were coming at me were, weren't something I could control. And I really needed to get, I felt very out of control. And so that was the beginning of my personal growth journey. I dove into self-help, uh, personal growth, personal development, whatever you want to call it. There's so many labels for this world of, I just call learning. And I found that as I was doing this, much of the work was, um, almost unattainable for the position I was in in life. You know, I didn't have all of the resources and time and money required to accomplish some of these things. Like, for example, a morning routine is something that is heavily talked about, right? In the personal development world, get up, do your workout, do your gratitude, have some green juice, whatever. Um, Get up an hour before you usually do. But like, like my, my babies were waking up at like 5.30 in the morning. And I'm like, there's no way I'm getting up at 4.30 to do these things. First of all, one of them is going to hear me, right? And then that'll be that. But also, it's just way too early. I just can't, right? So I, I got really good at finding ways to tweak the traditional personal development advice and make it work for me as a working parent. So um, from there, the retail store didn't actually work out surprise, surprise, timing was real bad, but I developed this passion for just sharing my knowledge with other moms. And that's where the podcast started. And it's kind of just grown from there. I know for me, during the the closures of our country, it was very difficult to 
identify what I was going to bring into this quote unquote new norm. And that was like the term that everyone was using. Right. Yeah. And I wish I had a little bit more guidance because probably like you during that time, like me and like so many others, we were kind of building it as we fly it, so to yeah. speak. Right. And I remember those, um, those meetings, CP24 news, for those who don't know, it was yeah. always popping up. It was like, okay, you're going to open up. We are free. And it was like two more weeks, guys, two more weeks come by. They would walk over and they're like, okay, we're free this time. They can't pull the same joke on us twice. And then it was two weeks more. And then two weeks turned into two years. Yeah. And <laughs> for a lot of people, they probably were struggling trying to understand, okay, how am I going to go back to my normal life or at least a version of that normality? I could sympathize with the parents out there because if you had children who you had maybe just before or during and you're trying to find them daycare that must have been a very difficult situation because you don't know how you're going to take care of yourself you don't know how you're going to take care of your children so Jill what was some of the commonalities that you're finding during the struggles of these mothers who are trying to figure out life when everything was just falling apart all around them yeah it was really hard because there was no constant to be able to hold on to for any of us right we didn't even have as a resource loved ones and parents and grandparents because we were told we we had to have this bubble of like 10 people, right? And so you're like, well, who is allowed to watch my kids and who's not? And do I really have to be the one to be there all the time? When does that leave space for myself? And it's so funny because we all individually had different struggles. I have friends who lived alone during that time and they would have loved to connect with someone Whereas I was connected to someone all day long, every day, and would have loved some time to be by myself, right? So um, just first off, acknowledging like it was hard for everyone. But if if you were someone who was in the thick of it with small kids and trying to work on yourself or work on something, it felt really impossible. Um, and I think some of the the main challenges that I saw was lack of understanding on how to take time for yourself and really have some self-care in the mix, right? That was still as a budding kind of term, self-care, but we're like, well, when, right? Um, and along that same line is like managing your time. When you're at home, time kind of, it warps, right? You don't get to go out into the world. The days kind of flow into one another. You're not sure what time it is, what day it is. You haven't showered. Like you're in the same clothes as you slept in it. We all did that. And it, lost meaning time. And so I feel like a lot of people forgot how to strategically plan their day around their values. Um, and time just kind of took over them rather than them having ownership of their time. And that can be super destructive. I know for you and I, we look like we're about the same age, right? We're still young, vibrant, and good-looking people. Totally. And <laughs> totally, right? And our childhood, we're probably, if you remember, we're probably running around and having all this fun and then you see some of these kids, they're just locked away in their homes, as you mentioned, unable to know their friends, maybe in the way they want to know it. Um, I know here in Canada, we had the remote teaching, which for many people was like a disaster and kids weren't even showing up. And I remember hearing stories that the teachers were a wall from their own classes <laughs> and all this stuff, too. So. What were some of the struggles for the children who maybe knew how life was before this and they're trying to figure out, Jill, I can't see John. I can't see Jane. I'm stuck with you all day long. Like, How were they trying to figure their lives out at such a young and impressionable age? Well, I can speak from my experience with like really small ones. They were living their best life. Like they had mom and <clears throat> excuse me, mom and dad home all the time. They were like this is great. I don't need anyone else. I've got someone here taking care of me, being my playmate. I've got everything I need. They're not going anywhere. But then when the pandemic is over and they're allowed to go back into their schools and they're allowed to see their friends and play at the parks, there's this level of hesitation that I think um, stole a lot of that spark from childhood for a lot of kids, especially the ones who got caught I can only imagine the the age group, like if you were maybe like in kindergarten, grade one, grade two, and then the pandemic hits, like that right there is this huge change, right? 
Um, and then you go back to your your normal. But for the kids who were small like mine, the change really came after the pandemic because all they knew was pandemic. So the challenge laid in getting them reaccustomed to socializing in schools, to sitting still in the classrooms, right, to um, sharing and playing with other kids their age. Um, and just in general, I saw with my friend group a lot of almost like stranger danger with their kids not being receptive to meeting new adults, um, even family members that they had maybe only been able to video with, right? Um so just some really interesting things that um, y- you wouldn't have necessarily expected from that period. One of my friends, she became an absolute shut-in. She stayed home, she isolated, and she got so used to life um, within, as you mentioned, her bubble, but her bubble is so small, it even excluded to a degree the people, her family that she actually lived with. Um, and she would tell me, like, she laughs about it now. She'll tell me stories how she'll stand at the door. Did you wash your hands? Don't touch anything. Do anything like that. Um, there's another person that he would actually get the hose and he would wash down his groceries oh, wow. before he put, yeah, he was, he was so hardcore with it. And one day I went to him, I was like, um, do you put the groceries wet in the cupboards? And he kind of looked like that. I was like, aha. <laughs> You haven't thought it all the way through, but it drove us to do some interesting and what some people probably think some crazy things. And when you mentioned the children, I think as as a parent, as an as adult, we focus so much time on them. But then we started to see how it started to impact the older generation, the Gen Zs, the um, the boomers, because these are people who spent many of their lives outdoors so often from their job, the trades, wherever. And unfortunately, I was told a story by someone who I live in the neighborhood with. And he said that his, he had his, his two uncles, they, um, they self-deleted um, because they couldn't handle life back out there again after so many years um, being alone, being by themselves. And just, you know, as you mentioned, the stranger danger, right? Keep your five feet. I don't want to really interact. So as we look to maybe put that behind us, what are some ways that maybe worked for you or that you believe can work for people to make sure that they're reintegrating even a year or so afterwards back into a normal social life? That's a great question. I think for me, much of the socializing and like being in the world again came from being comfortable with myself. Um, I, I teach all the time that before we go and do anything, we need to center and ground within ourselves first. We need to make sure we're aligned with our values. We need to make sure that we're trusting our intuition and listening right to that inner voice that we can trust because I think there's so much uh, mistrust, even the fake news. And like, this world's crazy. If you really think about it, like we're in a wild time. And so there's nobody knows who they can believe. Nobody knows who they can trust. And we forget that we can trust ourselves right? And the more authentic you are in your own skin, you start to recognize that authentic spirit within other people that you're encountering. And then that trust is there because you're like, oh, okay, that's you and me. We're, We're different, but we're both authentically ourselves and we're showing up in our truest expression, right? Of, of who we are. Um, we're not wondering like, oh, is that person, is that person thinking something different than they're saying, right? Are they, are they lying to me? Is there something I'm missing? Especially with social media, right? The comparison, we're only seeing the highlight reels of people's lives. We we have this, I think, um, misrepresentation of, of reality. And so the more that you can, within your own self and your own home, create that groundedness, the more confident you're going to be going into the world in any situation because you'll have that basis of truth to be working from. So that's for sure the first thing that I would say. Oh God, in terms of other things, I think just really having compassion and grace for everyone's different situations is a big way that you can ease social interaction 
from my experience anyways. Uh, I'm a Gemini in in astrology. So like I always see two parts of everything. So it's kind of my superpower in that way, as difficult as it can be. But if you're able to empathize that we've all gone through a really hard time recently, we're all trying to figure it out again. And things might look different for someone than they did before the pandemic, because perhaps like me, they went through this like big, I don't know, awakening and learning and transformation. Marriages have broken up. Babies have been born. Careers have been changed. Businesses have been folded and started. Like life is different for everyone. So even within people you know, their situation could be different. They could be a whole new person now, right? And just keeping in mind that we've all gone through this really sort of traumatic uh, life experience together, but individually uh, and giving grace to everyone for, for just figuring out where they fit again. Yeah. One of the things that I did as soon as I was free (laughs) and able to go outside is I think I went out and became like a hugger. Hey, how you doing, Joe? Big hugs, you know, um, because the interaction was so missing because I was one of those people that I tried to the best of my ability to abide by all the rules and and regulations. And I know that as soon as that hit, I went to the gym. I, there's people I didn't get to see. It was like a scene out of like a movie when the prisoner is past his, his parole. And he's like, okay, first thing he does is go see his wife. They have their moment. We'll keep it PG. (laughs) And it's, it's all love. Right. And one of the things that I loved, and, and you shared this earlier, is that you mentioned that you wrote about some of your experiences in your book and things of that nature, where it's happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Mm-hmm. And these are some of the things that maybe some people were, um, they were that was impacted for a lot of people during this time, or even in, in general, right? Like one of the best um, ways we can actually, one of the best gifts we can give someone is our time is our positive energy, right? So speak to us about the book and how did that come about and what's your um, insight into it and where do you want it to take you? Thanks. Yeah, it's been kind of a labor of love, to be honest with you. It's something that I actually started writing for my own self in my early 20s because I struggled with anxiety and I've always been that like personal development junkie. And so when I would learn something that I thought I could refer back to later in a hard moment, I would write it down so I don't want to forget it. And I sort of just accumulated this word doc of all of these like tips and tricks and quotes and and different things that helped me throughout the years. And and then after, as the pandemic got going and I started really diving deep into this, into habits, into time management, into mindset, the book got really big or this like word doc got really big. And I'm like, oh my God, like maybe this can help other people too. Like this is, this is really great. It's 20 years worth of like collecting helpful things. So I thought, well, what, what can I do with this? And I've always wanted to, um, to, to write books. I've always been a writer, but not ever published anything. And I thought, well, how can I put this together? And my original idea was to do, um, a page a day calendar, you know, those ones with like a quote, right. You put it on the mirror and then, and then I thought, no, I want people to, to keep hold of it. I, I don't want it to be a one and done. I want this information to really serve as a resource and a guide. And so what I ended up doing was sort of categorizing all of these pieces of information into the four chapters, happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise, because I think those are sort of the pillars we can all relate to wanting in our life. And it ended up being, it's just this, here, I've got it here. It's just like a little, a little book. And it's kind of, um, I call it like a companion. So the idea is you can flip it open to any page and they're just short little like easy peasy right? It's a quote. It's a tip. It's a piece of wisdom. It's a question to think about. It's an affirmation. You can say that you can grab a not difficult time that you can use to start your day off on a positive note. You can not look at it for three weeks and then pick it up again. It doesn't matter, but more of this sort of like daily companion to help you in those areas. So that's kind of what the book's all about. And I'm really, I'm really excited about it. It's turned into um, 
sort of a launching point for my speaking career as well, because I'm able to take these concepts and create keynote speeches for all kinds of different organizations and companies um, that resonate. These are topics that are universal. And so it's really cool to have something different than my podcast, which is solely focused on like moms. Other people listen to it, but it's really mom centric. Whereas this is something that I envision like giving a high school graduate as they're going into the world, right? Or like um, your best friend, if she's had a hard breakup or like it, it's for everybody, which is really exciting for me. Is the book like a, a moment in time for you where it shows this is Jill at this point in time, or is it like a, a running log of your life because you had an idea where you want to take it and go from there? Yeah, it's kind of it's free flowing. It's not any moment in time. And it's more just like if you had me in your pocket, giving you a piece of advice for the day, right? It's, it's, um, it's really not based on me more just that I am like a vessel sort of giving the information that's come through, writing it down, passing it along, kind of like a reporter in that way. Um, and I say so many times, it's so funny in the book. I say it's, it's not my, these are not my ideas. I can't take credit for any of this. I literally have heard it and either tweaked it or, you know, we give credit to whoever's idea it was in the book. And um, so it's just this culmination of wisdom and knowledge that's um, kind of timeless, you know? That's what I was thinking, because I love reading and many of the books I've I've read and will continue to read. It appears that even though it was written, let's say 2015, you can still pick it up and be like, oh, this applies to me today because it's like a running log of or, or a series of inspirational material where you can just say, okay, today I needed this. Tomorrow yeah. I may need that. That seems to be like the vision of where you want to take your book. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when you look back and you're in a reflective mode, Jill, um, are you, how proud are are you that you've come this far? And is there a moment that you're like, this was my defining moment, and I'm happy that this happened? You know, it's, it's stupid how proud I am. It's really stupid. I'm so excited about this because it feels like almost like the closing of a chapter because it has been so long that this has been sort of like in my world growing and, and expanding and I've been working on it. Um, last year, I had finished the writing part. And I sent it through for edits. I sent it to like a developmental editor to figure out like what goes where. And then I sent it to a copy editor who was uh, the sentence doctor. And like she fixed all my whatever grammar and um, past and present tense and all those things, right? Because you're just excited writing it. You don't think about that. And then I left it. And I was like, but I, I'm, I was scared maybe. I'm not sure. It was a whole year that went by. And it was essentially done. But I got stuck on how it was going to look because I hadn't decided that at that point, is it a page a day calendar? Is it like a coffee table book with a beautiful picture and a lot of white space with a little like, what is this? And I let myself put it on the shelf. And I won't really, there wasn't really a particular moment in time, but I was working with a business coach and um, we had just finished some really incredible work together in terms of my speaking career. And then she said, well, what's next, Jill? And I'm like, I need to just get this book in the world. Like, let's just do that. And so we worked together and she, she helped me just finish it and um, being able to go through it self-published. So I did all of the writing, obviously all of the design of the cover, all of the work to get it in chapters and Barnes and Noble and on Amazon, like all of that is just one person doing it. So the pride I feel because of that, like I figured out how to do it, which is super cool. Um, yeah, it's kind of a long winded answer to that, but I feel so proud of it. It's like a baby for you, right? This is your creation. And yeah. You mentioned the book, you mentioned the podcast, and you mentioned that it is mom centric. So what are some of the topics that you touch on in regards to your audience who are mothers and how are you catering to them and maybe some of the things that they want to hear from you? Oh, the podcast is super fun because it's half an hour, quick and easy. Um, 
I do a lot of guest interviews on the podcast of people who are inspiring to me um, or are talking about things that I'm not an expert in, but I'm interested in. So it kind of takes a journey. We're two years into the podcast so far, and it kind of takes the listener on a journey of my growth. They're sort of like along for the ride, Um, but it's always brought back into this really, well, what does it mean? What is a take-home tactic moms can do today? to use this information, right? And like, okay, but here's an objection, you know, that I can already hear my listeners saying, yes, but this is my reality. How do I actually implement it? So um, it's talking to these experts and figuring out ways that we can implement these things into real life, or at least acknowledge that this is maybe not the season, but when you have a little bit more free time, when your babies aren't like, when they are sleeping through the night or when they are off to school or whenever you have that extra piece of time, um, here's something that you can look forward to doing. Or here is something that you can start learning about now and then you can really hit the ground running hard um, when you know you have that babysitter in place or when your income level has up leveled, whatever the case is. Yeah. So as we close, what's some advice that you'd want to leave with our mothers out there or maybe parents in general just to help them along in their everyday routine? Oh, God. I think the thing that's coming top of mind that I love talking about is weekly planning. It seems so mundane, but honestly, weekly planning is such a wonderful resource and a habit to get into because it the way that I teach it, you kind of bring in goal setting and mindset and productivity and habits all into your weekly planner. I've got like a paper one. I'm really old school. So I don't use a Google calendar. I just have an agenda. Um, And so the most helpful thing is to be able to look in advance at your week, figure out your priorities that are based on like the results you want rather than your to-do list. Um, And I have a whole system able to help people make the most of their week, get the the top three things they want to get done, but also where to find their free time in there. Because I think it's vital for people to have at least an hour in their week that's just dedicated for them so that they can sort of recharge or use that for whatever. You know, like my hour is often for a nap. It doesn't have to be anything earth shattering, but to be able to take that time, you really need to build it in. And so I think a habit like that if you're just listening and feeling like, oh, I wouldn't even know where to start, that taking control of your planner week by week is a really wonderful place to get started. 